Superborn's victory over Giorgio Petrosian marked the first time in years the fighter from Thailand had risen to the level of being ranked number one pound for pound fighter in kickboxing on some people's lists. While the country still boasts a large amount of dominance under the more liberal rules of Muay Thai, under the more restrictive rules of kickboxing, many fighters have tried to make the switch in recent years and experienced a rough transition. With the rise of the Chinese kickboxing scene, the Dutch and Japanese kickboxing scenes being as strong as ever, and other countries offering top talent, on balance it would seem like the odds would be longer on a fighter like Boakao transitioning from Muay Thai and immediately becoming the equivalent of a K1 Max tournament champion. There may be technical and tactical reasons as to why Superbon has been able to stand out from other fighters. However, this all ignores the fact that Superbon does have a unique strength and conditioning routine that separates him from other fighters, particularly from Thailand. In terms of Superbon's overall training, he does have a video on his YouTube channel where he details a typical week of training. He also has a number of training videos which will help you get a feel for his overall training. I am not going to comment on his overall training other than to say that it does look like a more stereotypical modern strength and conditioning routine. Instead I am going to focus on one particular exercise which you can see him doing here. The reason is not because this exercise is going to necessarily make or break his training routine. I do not have a detailed knowledge of Superbon's training routine and doing an exercise once or a couple of tries is unlikely to have a big impact on a pro athlete. The reason I'm going to focus on this exercise is because it remains a controversial issue and despite this, the exact setup has been investigated by sports scientists in a training study which provided interesting results. You can see the study title here on screen. I have left a link to the study in the video description. It's an open access paper so anyone can read it if they want to examine it in further detail. So to focus briefly on the punch setup, to quote from the paper, the applied elastic resistance was the same for all subjects. It originated from rubber bands with one end externally fixed behind the subject, while the subject held the other end by his punching hand. So as you can see, the study uses almost exactly the same setup as is used by Superbon here, with the band being held in his hand rather than attached around his waist, which is something some have said is critical for producing results. I will have more to say on this study later in the video, but I would first like to do a brief commentary on the concept of mixing technique with strength. I guess it's possible that this practice dates back to Greek pancration and ancient civilizations, as the idea of mixing technique with strength, such as using a band or something like it to train a heavier punch, or a thrower throwing a heavier rock, seems like it's something that would appeal to basic common sense. However, in terms of its modern use, it would be fair to say that it starts with Nikolai Bernstein. Bernstein was a leading Soviet neuroscientist who was originally hired to study human walking to help with the engineering of pedestrian bridges. He would also be recruited to help refine large-scale manual labour tasks such as bricklaying. However, it was instead in the field of sports science where his work would make the biggest waves. Bernstein put forward the now pseudophobous theory of repetition without repetition, which is a key mode of performance principle which was used by Soviet sports scientists to dominate the sporting world from the 60s to the 80s. There are longer YouTube videos out there which get into the theory of repetition without repetition in depth. To do a brief description here, the idea is that in a sport, the internal and external conditions within the body will never be exactly the same. Therefore, no two roundhouse kicks thrown by a Thai boxer will ever be exactly identical. Neither will any two right hands thrown by a Marquis of Queensby Rules boxer. By extension, no two hip throws by a judo player will ever be identical. Nor will any two arm bars from a jiu-jitsu player. This contrasts with other models of motor learning, where it's often described that the goal of training is to ingrain a skill into your muscle memory through countless repetitions then execute this exact motor engram when the time arrives in your sport. Common sense supports Bernstein's work. For instance, if you watch a track and field event such as the long jump, elite competitors are not capable of predicting exactly where they're going to take off from on the takeoff board. 
nor do they ever execute an exact jump of say 7 meters 32 centimeters. There's nearly always some degree of variability in jump distance by at least a few centimeters. Similarly, by more obtuse conceptualizations of motor learning, an elite basketball player who has practiced extensively would never miss a free throw, yet it clearly happens. So in terms of training implications, the goal of training if you're following Bernstein's philosophy is not to rep out identical movements, but rather to toggle with a movement pattern and subject it to disturbances as the muscle memory will need to be adaptable as in a sporting context, the conditions for execution will never be exactly the same as the conditions for training. So punching with a band would be the perfect example of disturbing a movement pattern slightly while still retaining some of the core features of the movement. The other side to the motor learning problem is that people do develop a general knack of performing skills if doing them in repetitive fashion, even if every repetition is in practice subtly different. Building on the work of Bernstein, a lot of the famous Russian sports scientists operating from the 60s to the 80s, such as Yuri Verkashansky and Anatoly Bondashuk, would implement the concept of mixing technique with strength, either in individual cases working with athletes, or in published training studies published in the Soviet Sports Review. So all in all, the theory of repetition without repetition can to an extent assuage the fear of losing technique when mixing technique with strength at a conceptual level. The question is, what are the results in practice? Before taking a look at the Super Bomb Punch Setup study in further detail, I'd just like to briefly address the research from the Soviet Union. A tiny amount of the research that exists is referenced in Yuri Vygoshansky's Fundamentals of Special Strength Training in Sport. For example, Verkashansky cites a training study which showed that throwing a medicine ball that weighed 2 kg was more effective than throwing a ball that weighed 4 kg in terms of increasing maximum throwing distance in water polo players. They also found that the 4 kg ball started to have negative influences on technique. He also cites research looking at javelin training which found that 3 kg was the optimal weight for throwing the javelin in terms of optimizing technique and strength in the throw. Dr. Yesis, who conducted an extensive review of the Soviet research into combining strength and technique, would have this to say. And here we can use strength exercises that are specific to the neuromuscular patterning in the technique, which will then improve the technique and make you stronger at the same time. So it sounds like it can be a pretty good deal combining technique with strength. To look around at modern athletes, you can see plenty examples of them implementing these methods. You can see Henry Cejudo doing ground and pound here using a two band system with resistance attached at the waist and at the upper body. You can see 2022 Boxer of the Year Dimitri Bivol going for a single band system here. You can see Javonta Tank Davis going for a couple of different setups. He goes for resistance at the waist and upper body at times, and at other times with resistance only attached to the upper body. You can see Usain Bolt and also training partner Johan Blake sprinting with sleds in their training videos. A detractor would say that this practice should be avoided due to fear of it interfering with sprint mechanics. Yet yeah, that's hard to believe considering the success of the athletes in question. The first detail of the study which I'm going to single out is about the study participants. You can see that there are 40 different subjects, 14 from a kickboxing background, 13 from a savart background, and 13 from a boxing background. All of the participants were either members of the national junior team or national seniors team in their respective combat sports. They were also involved in regular training and had at least five years of martial arts training. The experience of the subject is a significant factor because when it comes on to the results, you will see the training improves lower body contribution to the punch. This would be less surprising in beginner subjects. In order to assess the contribution of different body segments, the authors note, four tightly secured reflecting markers were placed at the subject's body to record joint motion of specific joints. Specifically, they were placed over the bony landmarks of their dominant side wrist, elbow, shoulder, and hip. If you want to get heavier on the anatomy and precisely locate the markers, the authors make use of some anatomical terms such as stylog process of the radius, 
but I suspect for 90% watching, wrist is enough. The speed of the jab punch was measured before and after a six week training block, during a pad session after a warm up. In terms of training, the subjects train three times a week for six weeks. Specifically, the subjects perform six sets of 10 reps of the jab punch, with 10 seconds between punches and 60 seconds between sets. Each session was conducted at the end of their regular training session and lasted approximately 15 minutes. To look at the results, they can be seen here. As I said before, the paper is open access, so if you've made it to this point in the video, then I recommend either pausing the video to look at this graph, or using the link in the description, as this part is very significant. If you look at the key to the graph, you can see that the checkered boxes represent the pretest values, and the black boxes represent the post-test values. The top row looks at the limb velocity, and the bottom row looks at the extent of joint displacement. When you look at the top row, which looks at limb velocity, you can see that the difference between bars is greatest at the level of the wrist, with relatively minor changes in the speed of the hip. When you look at the bottom row, looking at the degree of limb displacement, you can see that there is a marked increase in the displacement of the hip in all groups except the control group, marked CG. So to refer back to Dr. Yes's claim. And here we can use strength exercises that are specific to the neuromuscular patterning in the technique, which will then improve the technique and make you stronger at the same time. The results of the study do seem to vindicate what he's been saying, as the speed of the punch has increased, indicating a strength and power benefit, and the degree of hip displacement has increased, indicating a refinement in the punching technique, with greater whole body contribution. So in conclusion, without making too big of a deal out of it, as it's likely only a small part of his training, the evidence supports that Superbon is smart for using this training setup. There are other ties out there using bands. However, equally, there are ties out there such as Superlek, who if the information he's putting online is to be believed, are still following a very old fashioned routine with lots of running, rounds and little resistance training. In terms of the concept of mixing technique with strength, there is enough research out there to say that it's a good idea, but it can potentially backfire at times. In this case, this setup was shown to be successful. However, for the best results, you may get better results rotating the setup and also attaching resistance at the waist at times if punching. I also think considering in this study, the participants only train three times a week for 15 minutes, Keeping this method to a small aspect of your training seems smart.